Good evening, everybody. Hey, man, I'm so glad to be here. I'm so excited, and I'm thankful that you're here. And thank you, uh, Pastor John and Karen, for giving me this opportunity. I kind of like them. Feels good. Hold it up close, huh? Well, I guess we were going to do something else, but I'll try to hold it up here. How's that? Anyway, uh, tonight, what, uh, what I'm focused on speaking about with you tonight is is that God's building an army and that he's building a strong army. He's building an army that can go through some stuff. He's not just building an army that can just enjoy all the fruits and everything all the time and have the perfect little lives. He's building an army of people that can go through some stuff and handle it. In other words, if, if we don't go through anything in this life, as ugly and as hurtful as it may be, but if we're not willing to go through it, then we're never going to get to that next level that he wants to take us to, to where we're really going to have some victory in life. And so sometimes we don't understand that. I didn't understand the recent struggle that I went through that ended up in liver surgery. And I know I'm not the only one that's had transplants. I'm not the only one that's suffered. I, I know that there's people that have suffered much more than I have, and some maybe not. But the point being it is that no matter what we go through, uh, Pastor John told me one day, he said, there is a pathway to healing. There is a pathway to healing. And when he said that, um, you know, as, a, as a, a man believing the word, I just, okay, Lord, I got it. You're going to heal me. And so the stages that I had to go through to get to that place to where I am now was a way different than I thought. Matter of fact, it was in some arenas, it was almost, almost to the point to where it's like, are you sure I'm doing this right, Lord? Because <laughs> it wasn't working out the way that I thought maybe it should work out. And so anyway, um, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Ron Giovanetti. And uh, I'm going to start a little from the beginning, if you don't mind, so you get a little background on why I ended up where I ended up. Because God will not be mocked what a man sows, so shall he reap. And, and that proved in my life, especially in this instance. This was probably, for me, this was probably the hardest battle that I went through in my life. And hardest meaning probably more towards tragic, possible death type of a situation. And so uh, I started out many years ago as a young boy raised up in the Bay Area. Um, I was born from my mother. She didn't think so after a while. She thought maybe somebody dropped me in from a stork or something, you know. But, but I was born. And uh, my parents, um, when I was about five years old, somewhere around that age, they had divorced. And, you know, I didn't realize much about it. You know, what are you going to think at five years old? You know, I just knew Dad wasn't there anymore and Mom was a boss. And so um, as life went on, I went through some um, other challenges, had a stepfather that that didn't like me, and, and so I, I think maybe those were some of the reasons. I'm not using that as any excuses for anything that I do, and believe me, uh, please don't, don't misunderstand me. I'm not blaming my parents for anything, okay? I made my choices in life. I have to own up to that, and that's one of the first things about getting freed up in some things in our life that we have to do is we have to own up to who we are and what we did and realize that it wasn't good. No matter what anybody else did to us, no matter what else happened around us, it, uh, it's all of our choice, it's all of our situation to make decisions on what we do, what we don't do, how we're going to respond through situations in life. And that's the test of life. And it's not like God has to test us to get us anywhere, but it, we live in this world, in this life, and there's going to be tests all the time. It's just tests. It's just the way it is. We might as well just get used to it and embrace it because it's going to happen. It's going to happen. So, so in order to mature in Christ, we've got to pass the test, right? We've got to keep passing the test. And if we fall back and if we fail some or whatever, you know, the Lord is merciful and gracious. It's not like he gives up on us, you know, if we, if we don't pass the test correctly or whatever that might be, however you want to think about that. But so anyway, what happened to me was I began to run around out in the streets. We went to church for a little bit when I was young, probably about five, six years old. So I, I heard about God, and I heard he had a son named Jesus Christ, and I knew this was this Holy Spirit thing. My, my grandmother's interpretation of it was kind of weird, but 
Um, I didn't have any idea what it meant to me. I just knew that on Sunday, I put on a nice little suit with one of those little clip-on bow tie things, and I went to church. And everybody else did the same thing. All the women wore white shirts and black skirts, and all the men wore um, uh, suits. And we all matched. That's, that's, that's how church was for me. And the, guy, and the pastor up in front, he was kind of, he would look at you and he'd, And I used to think, man, I hope I don't get too close to this guy. But, uh, <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> what happened was is after that and after the divorce and after that, my mom stopped going to church. And, um, um, and my dad was still going to the church. And she went for a little while, but after a while she had a hard time seeing him with another woman. And, and um, in, in that particular body, they seemed to kind of trade husbands and wives, it seemed like. But so, so she didn't like that anymore. She didn't want to go. So we didn't go anymore. And so she had to work all the time because my sister and I, you know, she wanted to make sure that our needs were met. And she was just a hard-working woman. She'd work, 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 work. And so I had a lot of free time. And so growing up as a, as a generally a pretty nice kid, pretty obedient kid, she just entrusted that I would stay that way. So what happened was, is I, I started to run around out in the streets. I was probably looking for something, somebody, you know, trying to be accepted somewhere, you know, wanting uh, something to happen in my life. And there was nobody at home. Dad wasn't there. Mom was working. My sister and I got along like, you know, how uh, siblings get along, right? So she had her life. I had mine. And I began to fool around with the guys that were smoking cigarettes. And I, I think I started smoking cigarettes about nine years old. Ten years old, we were already drinking. By the time I was uh, uh, somewhere in 10 years old, we were smoking pot already. And, you know, my life began in that direction. And even though I didn't agree with it, it was kind of cool to be around a group of people that all was doing the same thing, you know. So I went with it. Well, what happened was after years of, of drugs and alcohol and, and doing the things that I wanted to do that I thought was good, the things that I thought was right in my life, I ended up at 17 years old and I had some, some homeboys that I was hanging around with and they gave me a birthday present. They said, Ron, stick your arm out here. I said, what, what do you mean? He said, just stick your arm out here. And they gave me a shot of heroin. And, uh, and that became my first love <laughs> for another 13 years. So I, I went through all this stuff. I'm not going to go into a bunch of detail. I'm sure you don't want to hear all of it anyway. But I went through the whole thing, you know, the drug programs, the hospitals, the jails, the prisons, and prison life, and all that kind of stuff. And as a matter of fact, in 1986, I went into, the last time I went to prison was 1985 for a year. And in 1986 was when I finally realized that I didn't like my life anymore. It was like God was working. See, my sister was born again in the early 80s, and my mom even though she went to that, that church, they didn't teach the born-again experience. So she got born again, too. And so all of a sudden, they're getting all these people to start praying for me, you know. And so here I am in a prison cell one night, and all of a sudden, I have this convicting power over me to pray. It was kind of motivated and instigated by my mom because she sent a letter and said my grandfather was really ill. He had emphysema really bad for like 40 years of his life. And he, they said that he might not make it too long. So all of a sudden that night, I decided in, in my cell by myself, my, my roomie was out watching TV, and I was in my cell by myself, and I just decided I was going to have my moment with God. And I didn't expect anything from God, believe me, but for some reason, I had the faith to say a little prayer. And I said, God, I just want to ask you to keep me alive in here and keep my grandpa alive so I can get out and see him before he dies. And in that moment, I just kind of, I felt something different. It was the Holy Spirit. I didn't realize it then. But, and, and I said, and by the way, you know, I know this is your dime, but I got your attention here, so uh, can I finish? And um, I said, if you want anything to do with me, <laughs> man, I'm tired. I am tired. I am so tired of being tired. I'm just tired. I don't like the life. I don't like the people anymore. I don't like having, being nothing, going nowhere, doing nothing. I'm just tired of this prison stuff. I'm just tired. And so I didn't really expect God to answer me because I knew I was a pretty good sinner. Matter of fact, I knew I was practicing to sin every day. That's all I wanted to do was sin. That's, uh, that's my life. That's what it was, right? That's what it developed into. So as I'm kind of going around the prison this last time, I'm seeing people, and they're older than I am. You know, I was, I was 30 years old the last time I went to prison. And these guys were 45 and 50. And I'm looking around, and I can sense something inside of me saying, that's you. Well, you know, I had a big flashback in my mind because I thought, 
man, I was going to stop playing this game like 20, right? I just wanted to fool around while I was a teenager. And then when I was 20, I thought my life was just going to somehow change. And I was going to become this great guy with lots of money with the, you know, the two-story house, the two-car garage, the two dogs and the two cats and the two kids, right? I thought life was going to be perfect. Mrs. Wonderful was going to see me and go, that's my man. And everything was going to develop into what my dream was, right? Well, at 20 years old, I was so hooked on heroin, I couldn't see straight. So now here I am, I'm 30, and I'm going, wait a minute. <laughs> I've been playing this game way too long, and I don't know how to fix it. So when I cried out that night to God, not expecting anything, this is what he chose to do. I didn't hear no lightning bolts, you know, the roof didn't open up. God didn't speak to me and say, Rod, you are delivered. You know, I didn't hear any of that stuff. But I know something changed in my heart that night. And I know somehow God surgically took his spiritual knife and cut that passion for drug addiction right out of my heart because I never wanted another drug. I never used another drug from that prayer, praise God. And I didn't even know who Jesus was yet. Think about that one for a minute. I didn't know Jesus. I didn't meet Jesus till like two years later. But there's some things that happened. In 1995, uh, I went to apply for life insurance, and we found out that uh, there were some issues with my liver. Am I making anybody dizzy by pacing around? Okay. And so, <laughs> I like to travel. It's just, it's just me. So anyway, I, I go to this local chiropractor. He's a Christian man in a big town of Carruthers, right? Dr. Brett the Caesar, if you ever go to Carruthers. And I went with him, went to him by the suggestion of my dear brother that was trying to sign me up for life insurance. He was a Christian man too, good believer, went to church together, right? And he said, hey, go check out Dr. De Caesar. Maybe he can help you out. So Dr. De Caesar, very wise man, strong believer, but he, he understands the uh, the pharmaceutical side of things and the physician side of things, but also holistic healing. So he, he, he combines it all together and he understands it. And he says, he says, Ron, surgery should be the last thing, man. That shouldn't be the first thing that you go. He said, that should be the last thing that you have to do because I'm thinking we got to fix something here, you know. And so he tells me, he says, look, if you'll do what I tell you to do, he said, there's a 90% chance that your liver will restore itself. I said, okay, let's go. And man, I had to drastically change my whole life. Eating, exercise, I had to exercise. Can you believe that? I had to exercise and drink lots of water. And so I exercised, I drank a lot of water. My wife and I, we got the key to his gym because he had a gym, you know, on the back of his place there. And we used to go down there early in the morning, you know, and work out and all that stuff. Well, you know, in six weeks, my liver had completely restored itself. Just by changing my diet, just by drinking lots of water and exercising. By the power of God. Because there was a lot of prayer involved in that, too. But the, so the life insurance company was shocked, and they said, six weeks, man, this is a fluke. <laughs> right? So we went another six weeks, and then they said, yeah, I guess it's a real deal. And they gave me life insurance. So we're going along pretty good in life, you know, right? I mean, I can go back to my old ways of eating and all that stuff after a while. But we're, we're just moving right along in life. Everything seems to be going really good. And then around 2008, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, I start feeling like I want to take a nap at 2 o'clock in the afternoon every day. And that wasn't like me. I didn't do naps. I didn't do naps much when I was a kid. You know, they used to tie me in bed. But, so, so I'm wondering why all of a sudden, so my wonderful, beautiful, intelligent wife says, why don't you go to the doctor? <laughs> so I go to the doctor in 2008, and they diagnose me, and they tell me, yeah, you, you've got hepatitis C. And I go, I got what? <laughs> you got hepatitis C. I go, okay. So, see, all those years, I stopped using uh, uh, needles in 1985. It doesn't show up till 2008. So all that year, years uh, uh, that had passed, it had laid dormant. And what happens is, what the, what the doctors say is, is, when you get older, what happens is, is that your liver can't quite filter like it's supposed to. And then the hepatitis C begins to take over, see? And so... You know, at first it was kind of like, okay, whatever, Lord, I know you'll heal this thing, you know, and, you know, it'll be all right. Well, what happened was, is 
is I went on this medication in 2009 called uh, interferon. It's a weekly injection. And you have to take all these pills and stuff with it. And you've got to time all this stuff. And, you know, it's really becoming a pain, you know what I mean, to do all this stuff. And so, anyway, after, um, I think it was after seven months, the, the interferon, the uh, weekly injection wasn't working. You know, like, we're praying, like, like, God, what's going on here, you know? I mean, this, you know, let's get this taken care of, right? I got business to do. <laughs> I can't be fooling around with this stuff. So they stick me on this other one called Infragen. This is a daily injection. And so it didn't take very long before that daily injection started to take me places that I'd never been to before, kind of like Star Trek, you know. Woo-hoo. And so what happened was is I became so weak after about 12, 13 months there, I went straight from, you know, interferon to infrogen. I got so weak, my wife had to, like, pull me out of the car. <laughs> I mean, I, I was just like rubber, you know. And, and it was killing me while it was trying to heal me. But we just kept praying and believing God, you know, something's got to happen here. Well, after 13 months, they finally decide that, um, you know, I should take a little break. Uh, 13 months is a long time for anybody to do these treatments. And so we took a little break. Well, I had a couple months that my virus load, that's where they measure how much hepatitis C is in your blood. My virus load had zeroed out a couple of months. So I was pretty excited. I was thinking, finally, God, finally, right? Well, a month after I stopped all the injections, it came back. And it came back even stronger. So they gave me two options. They said, look, either you can go back on the treatments or you can wait for this pill that's coming out down the road. And the pill's going to be great. No side effects, no injections, la, la, la. Well, I didn't know at that time that it was Harvani that they were waiting for. But when he had told me about that around uh, 2012, I, it had turned into cirrhosis. And when he had told me that, the, he was like the pill was going to come out the next year or something. So I said, man, I, I don't want to put my life on hold for another year, right? I put my life on another whole, uh, year and it doesn't work. I said, then, I mean, I got, I got to go out and do stuff. I got to minister to people, man. I, you know, my, my heart is just like full here, you know, <laughs> even though my body's all jacked up. And so we went ahead and, and went along with, with the program without any medications or anything. And, and as my liver turned into cirrhosis, well, what happened was that began to take me down. And by 2014, December 19th of 2014, I was finished. I went to the boot camp for a Christmas party for the inmates, you know. And when I came home that day, that was it. I couldn't go no more. See, previously, before that, a few months before that, I started to swell up with ascites fluid. And I, I was like 202 pounds, but I had like 35 <laughs> pounds of fluid in me. And, and so when I finally realized to go to the doctor, and he said, man, why didn't you come in? I, I, don't know, I thought the stuff would just go away, whatever, you know. And so I had to go to the hospital, you know, and they have to drain you and all that stuff. And I gave him seven liters the first time. <laughs> so I immediately dropped 35 pounds. Poof. So I was feeling pretty good. But it swelled back up again. And we go drain it again. It swelled back up again. And it kept doing it. It kept going through this process all the way to surgery, right? So what happened after that was, is finally I got connected to a doctor, Muhammad Sheikh in Fresno. This guy is very, very intelligent. I mean, he, he was kind of nursing me back to where I was actually feeling a lot better. And so what happened was, was when I first went in there, my wife overheard him say, I can't understand people with accents really good and when they speak low. I can't, I can't really hear you. But my wife can hear, and she said, I heard him tell that guy, you're a really sick man. <laughs> You know, we're believing God, and we're praying, and we're just, you know, going on with life, you know. Okay, God, I know you're going to handle this somehow, some way. And so we get everybody praying for, for God to heal my liver. See, I didn't want to have to go through surgery. I, you know, when I thought about having a 2080 insurance, and when I asked the, the, the surgeon up in UCSF how much it, it could cost, he said it could be up to a million bucks. I'm thinking, 250 grand in debt? No way I'm not doing this. And plus, I didn't want to take the time to go through the mess. You know, I wasn't concerned about whatever it was going to take or painful or anything like that. I just didn't want the debt. <laughs> you know, I just didn't want it. So what happened was, was, was um, my wife one day, she just asked the doctor, she says, hey, can you put Ron on the transplant list? Because I'm thinking we're just going to walk this thing out, you know. And, but she asked the doctor, he said, oh, yeah. Well, come to find out, he used to intern up there before he started his own practice here in Fresno. And so he just got on the phone and made a phone call, and we were on our way to getting on the list. <laughs> and 
And so we started going up to UCSF and uh, had to go through some beginning stages and all that kind of stuff. And I'm feeling pretty good, but my numbers are saying that I'm a, a very ill man. But I'm not ill enough to be at the top of the list. You've got to be, like, almost dead because at that time there was 18,000 people on the list and there was only 6,000 livers. So, like, if you're not three days in ICU about to die, you're not getting a liver. So I'm thinking, okay, Lord. Am I just going to have to hang out like this, you know, kind of half healed and half sick? Or, you know, I guess if this is what you want me to do, then, you know, I'm starting to try to rationalize things with my own mind instead of sticking to what I should have been saying. Got to admit, there was a few times when I said, hey, Lord, um, you know, are you punching my ticket? You know, you go a couple of years, and you just it's kind of like, okay, Lord, if you're punching my ticket, let me know, because I don't have my affairs in order, and I don't want to leave my wife and my family and my kids, you know, in a bad way. I did have a couple of those moments. One time when I did, the Lord sent a wonderful lady named Linda Tucker over to my house, and she came in, and she walked in and said, I come to tell you that the Lord said you're going to live, and you shall not die. And whoo! Oh, that got all over me. And I began to think, man, what am I talking about here? What am I doing? I'm starting to ask God if he's going to take me home, and he wasn't nowhere near ready to take me home. And so we just continued on like we were and kept going to UCSF when we had to and, you know, um, waiting for something to happen. I had no idea what was going to happen, but they're telling us to look for a live donor. And I'm, both of us are looking at each other, and I'm thinking, Hey, brother, can I have half your liver? <laughs> How you do that, right? <laughs> How you do that? They said, we'll start with your family. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> hey, mom. <laughs> hey, son. None of them matched. So my family wasn't going to be able to do it. And what happened was one day, my sister lives, still lives up in the Bay Area, so I spent a lot of time at her house so we didn't have to drive all the way from Madeira to San Francisco, you know. <sighs> I spent probably like, three months <laughs> at my sister's house. And um, what happened was one day while I was sitting there, we had just come back from, uh, um, from UCSF, had a little training, a little thing. And they, what they said at that training was it was, it was more for the caretaker uh, than it was for me. But the, one of the things that stuck with us that they said was a very tall man couldn't donate to a very short man and vice versa. You know, things won't line up, you know bow ducks and, you know, all those types of things. They just won't line up because his will be so big, mine will be so small. So we're thinking, okay, now we've got to look, start looking for a guy about my height, right? And so <laughs> well, what happened was one day I was sitting in my sister's recliner, just starting the day off like regular. You know, we've got all these medications and all this stuff. I mean, I've been on every diet possible, you know what I mean? And not necessarily a diet, but a change of the way you eat, food eating, um, dietitian stuff. And so... It was a lot of work to do all that stuff. Have some of you experienced that? It's a lot of work to have to not eat this because you're taking this medication and not do this. And, and, you know, all the stuff that you used to do, you used to just do whatever you wanted to do. Now you've got to do what they tell you to do. And, and it's a lot of work. You know, I had, I had a container four times a day full of pills at one time. I had to make sure you had all the right ones at the right time. And, I mean, it, you know, it, this takes some work. So anyway, back to my sister. I'm sitting there in the morning, and... <laughs> I get up, sitting in a rocking chair, going to town. And at that time, I'm still pretty weak, right? So they're feeding me and pretty much taking care of me. And, and you know, and I'm not really liking this. I'm kind of getting tired of it. I mean, it is nice, but I'm getting kind of tired of it, you know. But, but you know, <laughs> love you, babe. <laughs> and I get a phone call. And it's a kid from the Youth for Christ office. I say a kid because he, he was only about 30 years old then, right? And so... He just calls me up out of the blue, and he says, uh, hey, I just want you to know, man, I'm going to be your donor. You're going to do what? Say it again? Yeah, I'm going to be your donor. I said, are you kidding me? No. I said, are you sure? Do you realize? Yeah, 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 yeah. I already talked to my wife. I already talked to my family. They all said, yeah, I'm going to do it. And I said, why? And he said, the day that Karen and I had swung by the Youth of Christ office to say hi, we were going to the doctor. There was one time, and when we went in, he was there. And when I walked in and said hi to everybody, um, as I was leaving, he said, 
hey, Ron, what's your blood type? And I said, I got no idea. They don't tell you that, right, unless you ask. And, and he said, well, if you find out, let us know, because somebody in the office might have your liver. And he's thinking somebody else. He's not thinking him. He's thinking somebody else in the office, right? So after I leave, he says, the Lord said to him, what if it's you? And he said he got hot from his feet to the top of his head and back down. And, and so he's questioning, you know, like, really, Lord? You know, and, and all that type of stuff. And this, all of a sudden, he becomes proactive. He gets his blood checked. He gets everything done. He gets all the stuff needed, right? And he calls me up and tells me, I'm going to be your donor, man. Really? So this is how Lord moves in, in many things that we don't see at the time. From the time that he called me, it wasn't even three months and we were in surgery. I mean, it was like boom, 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 boom. And we were there. We prayed for him because I thought, Lord, look, this guy's given me his liver. Make sure nothing happens to him, okay? He was out in six days. Within two months, he was back to work full time running two miles a day. Now me... Had a few more challenges. Matter of fact, I had quite a few. <laughs> In and out kind of stuff. You know, I, I, it's different. You know, for the person that's giving, they don't quite have as much stuff to deal with. I, I mean, I just got, the liver has two lobes, and so I got his 40%, and mine was completely removed. And he kept his 60%, so his had to only grow back to 100% for him. Mine had to go from 40% to grow to 100% for me. So we had some issues in and out of ICU. There was a, a lot of different things that went on. But you know what? I have to say it was a blessed time. Um, being in the hospital, even though all that we went through and everything that happened, it was really a blessed time. The people that we got to meet, even I went to Fresno for two weeks one time. You know, when, you're, when your liver stops working, really strange things happen. Because what happens is when your liver starts slowing down or quits working, the, the alcohol in your body, it backs up into your brain. And then you do things like you don't know who you are or where you are. She used to catch me in the bathroom. I'm playing with the blind at 2.30 in the morning and stuff. You know, I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know who I was, where I was. So she had to call friends to come and help get me in the car to get me to the hospital. One time she had called. Anybody know John Barsotti? Yeah. He offered, and she called him up one night, came over, and got me in his car, and took me to the hospital because it happened to me twice. <laughs> kind of wigged out twice, you know. And so just go, that part of it right there alone, you know, was, was pretty strenuous. And then to have to now go to surgery and go through those types of things, there's a lot involved in all that stuff. A lot of stuff that you don't know and you don't recognize and you don't realize, you know. And so we had a great time, though. I mean, I came, the Lord blessed me so much. You know, one of the things I just asked the Lord that, hey, I got to I got to do your will here while I'm here no matter even if I'm not feeling good or whatever you know but I, you know I haven't stopped serving you just because I'm in this condition and and the Lord just made so many opportunities for us to be a blessing to other people and I jumped I, I was off of medications in 3 days Yeah completely off of medication in 3 days I was up walking around already and they were just amazed at that As a matter of fact I can remember one Morning, I came out of my room to go for a walk or afternoon, whatever it was. And one of the nurses says, there's the miracle man. And I said, that's right. <laughs> that's right. And you, you get a shirt um, called the Long Mile. If you, is that the name of it, babe? I walked the Long Mile. What happens if you walk a mile on the inside, they give you a shirt. It says the Long Mile on it, you know. And, and I got mine in three days. Yeah, yeah, but the, but the Lord just gave me the ability in there to, to continue to smile a lot. Every time anybody came into the room, i good morning, good evening. When the doctors would come, I just had the ability to just, just be a blessing to them. And, no, everything's good, and, you know, I'll, you know, and just go through everything that I had to go through. It was just amazing, you know, for being in that condition. I was so thankful to be able to do that. And as a matter of fact, one time I went for an x-ray or 
something like that. I don't know what it was, an endoscopy or a colon, you know, all the peas, you know, all that kind of stuff. And so I was going for something, and one of the nurses came in and told my wife, she said, yeah, the nurses argue over who gets to come in your room. <laughs> Praise God. See, you can still be the light even when you're hurting. You can still be a blessing to people even when you're in a, in a hard situation. And, and, uh, and I know it's, it's the Lord that gives us the strength to do that and gives us the ability to do that. You know, because if he's going to work all things meant for evil, made for good, there's going to have to be something else in there besides our own strength and what we can do. You know, if he's not moving in a situation, what I learned going through the surgery and everything, and I could see a better speed it up here a little bit but one of the main things that i learned about going through all the surgery and all that kind of stuff was that there was some things going on in ron that the lord needed to change and so i'm not saying you know he didn't give me the hepatitis c i injected it into my own body that was my fault he didn't make me sick i made myself sick and so, but what happened was, was he was going to take that situation that was meant for evil and he was going to make something good out of it if I just continue to follow him and, and, and do what I know to do, right? So, so I would have intimate times with the Lord laying in my bed. And, you know, I don't know if you've been in a hospital for a long time or not, but what happens in there is they wake you up every two to three hours. So you never really get any sleep, and, and you have to learn when they're not coming in to do things, right, so, so that you can at least sleep a little bit or get something done. And so I started being able to take some time after surgery to, to Spend time really with the Lord. Spend some real time with the Lord, you know. And, and my wife, you know, she was, she was faithful to, to let everybody know what's going on. Everybody keep praying, you know, and, uh, and for the things and for the issues that were going on with me because there was, there was a lot of issues that we had to go through before I was actually released. And then after I was released, I came back two more times and was admitted, you know, because these little things were going wrong. And so, so th there's a lot of... of of questioning in there if you're not solid and firm and understanding, okay, Lord, you're going to get me through this. You know, this, this that's meant to destroy me, you're going to make it uh, raise me up and become more than I've ever been before in my life because you've got a purpose in this. See, you're going you're gonna to take this thing that, that the enemy means for evil. You're going to take this thing that everybody else thinks is tragic and you're going to glorify it because it's going to glorify your kingdom. And so, and so we, as I walked through that process, and one morning, I remember, one early morning, it was like 5.30 in the morning, I think, something like that. I woke up, and I was just thanking the Lord so much for the cross, and I was just thanking him for, for all that he was doing. I was just thanking him for the whole ordeal. And, and all of it, he showed me something that was, that's been very important to me, and I remembered it for a long time now. He showed me um, a, a cross, right? Well, my, my surgery scar, um, it goes like this across. I wish it went this way and smiled, but it goes this way, across. And, and Jameson was just a little up and down scar like this. And the Lord showed me at that time that he said that Jameson was that support for me so that I could stretch out my arms and love the world. And it, and it, just, and it just blessed me because it's one of those moments, you know those God moments when you know that he's talking to you and he's showing you something. And, and so we had a lot of... Uh, uh, you know, intimate times like that and things. But this was probably one of the most important things before I, before I get to the end of what I want to say here to you. You know, I was involved in ministry before I became very ill. And that was my life. It still is. But that was my life. But in ministry, it can be no different than in everyday life working a, a job or doing whatever we're doing. If, if we're not staying connected and focused on what the Lord wants us to do, how he wants to grow us into the next level, how he wants to continue to build his army in us, right? If we're not doing that, we become stagnant. So see, not only was the Lord going to give me a new liver, but he wasn't going to give me a new liver so that I could just continue to live the life that I lived before. See, I became complacent. Ministry could be like anything else. People are, I'm going to boot camp, I'm going to Jude Hall, I'm going to campuses, I'm going to churches, I'm going wherever I'm going, right? People's lives are being changed, things are happening. And what happens is you can get comfortable with that. Well, Lord, everything must be okay because people are getting saved. You know, everything's okay because, you know, I, I don't see no real issues here. There's no real problems, right? Everything's going like it should go, floating right along. But what happens is, 
is in that dormancy, the Lord wants to do some pruning time. So not only did he take an old dead liver out of me, because I promise you, if you saw my liver, it was dead black. I was breathing and I was moving because of the grace of God. My liver was dead. And so that dead liver that he took out of me, he also pruned some dead spiritual things out of me. And then he began to fill me back up with his anointing. That I began to have those visions and those things in the morning, and I began to worship him. I'd walk down the hallway and sing, How Great Is Our God? And I just, you know, it, it, just, it was amazing how my life began to change. And it wasn't just a, the physical thing. I no longer looked at the physical thing. I was looking at what he was doing in my heart. And I was becoming inspired to hurry up and get out of there because I just wanted to do more for him. I just wanted to know him even more. I wanted to get some sleep, praise God. But I wanted, you know, I just, I really, <laughs> I really knew that I, I, Lord had something for me to do, but I had no idea what it was. You know, because at that time, when you get your guts ripped open, if you're a singer, it takes a long time to get some strength in there to sing again. You know, I had stopped playing the guitar for so long, I'd lost my calluses, and I was like, I'd forgotten all the songs that I used to play all the time, every week. I just couldn't remember how they went. I couldn't remember how they're going. I'm thinking, man, Lord, I need your help here. I need your help. Well, I called Pastor John, praise God, when I came home one day because, you know, I just thought I was going to call him and say, hey, I'm back in Madeira. Praise God, you know, somebody ought to shout hallelujah, and, you know, and I'm coming back, and I'm here. And, and this is something that had gone dormant in my life, see, because I grew up in, in all the fivefold ministry and belief and everything. You know, in other words, I wasn't taught to not believe anything because the people that I listened to helped me understand faith and believe in everything, right? And so I grew up in that, but unfortunately in ministry that I was involved in, you know, when you go into an institution, those types of things, they want, you know, you, they want you to shut those things down. You know, they don't want you busting out in Holy Ghost power, even though I kept praying for it, you know. But, you know, so we had some small movements of the Spirit besides outside of salvation, but it was very minor. So, so the gifts of the Spirit that I operated in before I started in that ministry kind of went kind of dormant. So I called Pastor John up, and I, while we're talking, all of a sudden I feel this welling up inside. You ever felt that? Yeah, I felt this welling up inside, and I thought, wow, really? <laughs> Praise God, really? And I said, Pastor John, I think um, I have a tongue for you to interpret. And he said, oh, yeah, what is, what is it? So I gave it, and he began to prophesy it over me. He said the devil knew it, what was going on. The devil was attacked. God knew that he was going to attack your life, and he was going to try to take your life. But he says, I wasn't going to let him by no means and no way. And it was a quite a long prophecy, but all I can remember from it was, and he said, this is what I'm going to do with you. He said, I'm going to take you, and I'm going to set you on a plateau. He said, you're not going to have to climb there. You're not going to have to struggle to get there. I'm going to put you there. And he said, when he saw, he saw, saw me running towards the biblical end time harvest, running towards it. And then he said, the Lord showed it in the backside of me, and there was a big group of people running with me, praise God. And in that moment, in that moment is when I realized that everything that I went through was a purpose you ever wonder why you go through something like god why did that happen i knew in that moment why i went through what i went through i knew god had a greater purpose and a greater plan that i just wasn't going to go through that because i was lacking faith or because of this or because of anything else it was an attack it was an all-out assault on my life and my family and god said no can't touch him Whew. Daddy said no. And when Daddy said no, everybody listened. <laughs> everybody listened. And the, and the anointing started to come back into my life. And we started having prayer meetings and some different things going on. And, 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 and now with music, all of a sudden the Lord put in my heart to begin to do music. And, and so I had to practice that guitar and get my fingers back in shape and get my calluses back. And I started to sing, and I kept working with it and kept working with it until I got stronger and stronger. And when the time came, the Lord connected me to CJ, and we started fire starters in the morning because Pastor John invited me on a Tuesday morning for prayer, and I played the guitar, and the anointing filled the room. And I, and I said, okay, Lord, you got a purpose for me here. And this is much far different and much far greater than I ever had before. That's just what it is. He's building an army. See? 
and he doesn't want us to stay where we're at for too long. You can rest and hang out for a little bit, but he wants to take us to the next level. And especially when it looks like all hell is coming against us, he's going to get you through that, and when he takes you through that, you're going to come out on the other side, and you're going to dance, and you're going to shout, and you're going to say, yes, Jesus loves me. Woo! <laughs> Ain't no devil in hell can steal your life from Jesus. But are you willing to go through it? That's what he's asking. When he said, come follow me, he meant it. When I look at the Apostle Paul and guys like that, I think, man, I ain't been through nothing. <laughs> the first beating and left for dead, I might have burned rubber after that one. So what we go through is really minuscule compared to what some other men of faith and women of faith have gone through, really, when you think about it. But it's the, the, the growth that it causes inside of us to go through something that we begin to realize that it's an honor to serve the Lord. It's an honor to go through things because he's going to get us through it. And when he gets us through it, it's going to be so victorious, it's going to be so joyous that we almost want to go through something else. Oh, yeah. I even got an amen for that. Praise God. But it is. I don't know what the next battle is going to be. I'm expecting it's going to be pretty tough because, you know, as life goes on, the battles get a little tougher, don't they? Especially when you start standing up for faith and you start saying, that nah, devil, yeah, man. you ain't nothing. He wants to show you he is. <laughs> he wants to show you he is. But God is preparing us. God is preparing us our whole life. Our whole Christian walk, God is preparing us. And he doesn't want us to ever get to a place where we're saying we've had enough. There's no retirement in the kingdom of God. That's right, Sister Carol. You just keep on trucking. You play this organ as long as your fingers will let you. Don't ever give up. The exciting part about serving the Lord is knowing that. That no matter what happens, he's got it. No matter what we're going to go through, he's going to get us through it. No matter how hard it hurts, no matter how ugly, how tragic it might be, he's got something on the other side of it if we'll just go through the valley. You've got to go through the valley. David said that so perfectly. Yes, though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, I will fear no evil because you are with me. Even when... It doesn't feel like it. You're here. You live in me, praise God. So I started reading some things after I began to recuperate. And I probably left a lot of things out about my beautiful wife. But I'll tell you what, um, for either one of you, if you go through something and you have a spouse that sticks with you, and I mean, she had to do everything. She had to learn to do everything that I did, plus all that she did. So it was a... It was a tough battle for her alone. And then wondering, you know, of course, what's going to happen to my husband? Now, in 2016, I was inspired by these words from the Lord. And he told me in the beginning of 2016 that everything clean in 2016 and complete. So I kind of had an idea about what everything clean would be, you know, backsliders coming home, us cleaning up our lives, you know. I didn't know that he was going to start from the government down or from down up through the government. I didn't know in 2016 he was going to rip everything apart like he did, right? And so, so at the end of 2016, around November, I asked the Lord, I said, okay, I understand what everything clean means, but okay, what does everything mean complete? I don't understand what's going to be completed. And he, at that time, he had mentioned to me, he said that, Everything, every evil, everything that has held my people back, everything that has caused them to detour away, every evil thing that has plagued them, he says that is going to be completed and come to an end in 2016. And he said, everything that I'm going to do is going to be new in 17. I'm going to do a new thing. It's not going to be the same. I'm going to begin to do a new thing. So he's, he's building. We can sense it. We can feel it. We understand it. We know it now. God is on the move. He's getting ready to do some mightier things than we've ever seen in the earth. And he's saying, people, my people must be prepared. We must be ready. 
We must begin to understand that the things of this world must become strangely dim because I'm getting ready to do something, and if you ain't listening to me, if you're not following me, if you're doing your own thing, you might miss it. And if you miss it, you'll regret it for the rest of your life. Planet Earth is just not going to stay the same. If you can't feel the birth pangs, I mean, just what's going on around the world right now, you know the uproar that's going on is because all of that satanic power, all of that deception, all of that mind control in the lives of those that are not believers, even those that think they are and are not believers, all that stuff is going to come down. God is getting ready to crush our enemies. Bless you. So as ambassadors for Christ, it was revealed to me that in Matthew 21.10, I read this one day, and, and I mean, it just went all the way through me, praise God. And it said, Jesus rode into Jerusalem and the city was moved. Jesus rode into Jerusalem, and the city was moved. And I began to understand that we carry the Lord Jesus Christ within us, right? This city should be moved because we're here. This city should not stay the same. This city should begin to change and continue to change like never before, because when we come into the city, the city is moved. We're not just walking the streets, you know, taking care of business. We're carrying Jesus Christ with us, and everywhere we go, this city should be moved. We should be impacting somebody or something in our city. Some of us have to begin to believe God for the focus of what He wants to do from His anointings and His gifts in our life, some of us have to just practice at home. And then once we get the home settled, then we can begin to go out into the world. And as we go out into the highways and byways, Sister Jessica, as we go out there and minister out there, people's lives are going to be moved by the power of Jesus Christ. Do you believe it? And then I saw in Mark 9, 49, seasoned with fire and salt. And when I read that, I thought, yes, we are seasoned with fire. We're supposed to be on fire for Jesus. We're supposed to carry this fire power inside of us that's ready to leash itself out and salt and flavor the earth with Jesus Christ. Preserve the earth with Jesus Christ. There's a fire down in there. We sing it all the time, right? There's a fire down. I know your flesh right now is saying, no, there ain't. But your spirit is saying, yes. Your spirit is saying, yes, there is. There is something in me that only God put in there. Couldn't nobody else put in there and can't nobody else have it unless I give it away. Praise God. I'm preaching myself happy. Luke chapter 12, verses 49 and 50. Jesus sends fire to kindle in us. The baptism of fire that he is, and he will be distressed until it's complete in us. Read it for yourself. Jesus is distressed unless the full baptismal power of fire is within us and it's operating through our lives. He's distressed. He's saying, I've given this to you. It's yours. Take it. Run with it. Lay hands on the sick so they'll recover. Cast demons out of those oppressed by the enemy. Man, we have such a demonic world right now that needs to be cast out, praise God, in Jesus' name. I'm speaking to people online that are going through tough stuff right now, and Jesus is speaking to you to receive that baptism fire that will change your life drastically forever. You will never be the same. You will accomplish things that you could never accomplish on your own. You will know things in your mind, heart, soul, and body that you can't learn from a book, that you can't learn from an order of the past, that only God can show you and teach you for yourself. Believe it and receive it in Jesus' name. So I got a couple more goodies for you. 
We are his elect. You're elected, brother. And we're not taking a vote. You're elected. That word in the Greek means we are selected for divine mercy or favor. Divine mercy or favor, especially for salvation. So if we're elected, we've been given this for salvation already. Divine mercy towards others. God's favor to come upon them when we shed mercy on people, that that mercy will cause the favor of God to save them. And then I heard this word one day, magna. And I thought, what the heck is magna? I know it has something to do with a volcano, right? But it says, in the dictionary, magna says that it means truth is great and will prevail. Truth is great and will prevail. So we are the magna of God. We are elected. And we are the magna of Jesus Christ. That truth will prevail through us. Thank you, Jesus, with favor and mercy and grace. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. God's building an army. I know you're all signed up. I know you're all signed up. But I hope this just helped you understand that, you know, no matter what it is we go through in life, God's got a plan. It ain't over. The devil ain't going to win unless you let him. He ain't going to win. I know my, my mama, bless her heart, you know, after I recuperated from surgery, um, my mom went home to be with Jesus. And... I just was strong enough to be able to go up and clean the stuff out of her house. But see, we prayed and prayed and prayed, just like we prayed for me to, for God to fix my liver inside of me. He had another plan, see, because he needed to do some more surgery in me. Those spiritual things needed to be pruned out of me. And he took that time to do that. I'm not saying he made it happen. I'm just saying he took what was already there. He called something that, was not into something else in my life. And, and so my mama, though, we were praying for her. And finally one day, as you know, I was pleading with the Lord, you know, heal, blah, blah, you know. And she just went on a long time with sores that wouldn't heal. And she just had a lot of issues, right? And finally one day she just said, son, I've lived my life. I'm tired. And she'd been telling me that for a while. But this day she said, I've lived my life. And when she said that, I realized I need to let her go. Because our prayers were holding her. <laughs> but she wanted to go home. And shortly after I released her, she went home. But if it ain't that, go through it, praise God. If you're ready to go home, you're ready to go home. Nothing else anybody can do about that, right? God will receive you if, you, if that's what you really want. But until then, we're onward, soldiers, marching forward. We're taking back what the enemy has stolen. We are, we are an army of God. We're built by him, by heavenly things. We're called to, to be uh, his soldiers and his ambassadors and his entity within the earth. He hasn't made us uh, just to be kicked around by the devil and enemy forces. He hasn't made us to sit around and let somebody else do it. He hasn't made us to, to uh, kind of believe and not believe. He's called us to believe. Jesus talked about believing, I think, more than he talked about faith. Because you can have faith. As a matter of fact, I got faith that I'll get a paycheck at the end of this month, but it might not show up. But if I believe something, right? If I truly believe, if God says I can do something and I believe that, that initiates my faith into a deeper realm because I believe it with no doubt. Doesn't James say that? No doubt. Totally, fully believing. Because if we doubt, 
We all know the scriptures, right? It's like a ship being tossed to and fro. And we receive nothing from God. He's calling us to believe. When he tells us something, he's calling us to believe it. And he's not telling us to believe it until we think it's long enough. He's telling us to believe it every day, every second, every minute. Keep believing, keep believing. When it looks like you're just about to take your last breath, keep believing that God still has a plan for your life, whatever he's telling you, right? He's wanting us to step up to the plate. So I'm going to say one more thing. And then I know it's late. I'll, I'll let you go. But I think this is really important. I meant to say this earlier, but uh, I, just, I just got it back up. I went through an experience where what happened was, was I had, you know, I had all these tubes and stuff hanging out and stuff. And, and this one started to bleed the wrong color. And so um, what happened was is something broke loose in there. I, don't, I can't remember all the details now. So they ran another shunt down inside of me, down this side. And they said it was going to be hard to get it in there, but I had a pocket of, ugly stuff in there they wanted to get out. And so uh, what happened was when they put it down in there, they ruptured my diaphragm. And it created some kind of pain. I'd never felt pain like that. I've, I've had some pain in my life. You know, I put myself through that running the streets. But, I, I mean, this was pain. And so I had a moment in my, in my room, you know, where I, you know, every time I'd wake up because of the pain, you know, I'd hit the button looking for the nurse so I could get some more pain medicine, you know. And that's not like me, you know. I, I, I don't want medication, but it was painful. And so one night I remember crying out when the nurse came in. I said, Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. And, you know, after she left, I immediately began to think, that wasn't a very good witness. I'm asking God to have mercy on me to take the pain away, and she's watching me scream because I need some medication now. I just don't look right. It don't look like my God loves me. And so what happened was is I realized um, shortly after that, I realized that I was asking for the wrong thing. God already had mercy on me. He was sustaining me with his mercy. But what I should have been asking for was God give me strength. God give me strength to endure this pain. Give me strength to endure this pain so I can be the witness you want me to be to these people. See, otherwise, too, he looked like a weak God because I'm crying out for mercy and it's not happening, right? In my mind, in my thinking. So God gave me this revelation about that. He says, son, you got to learn to go through stuff, son. Ask for strength. Ask for endurance to go through things. Don't ask me for to remove everything. You know, this isn't McDonald's. We don't drive through and I heal you and you drive on. I mean, yes, he does do that. But in that moment, in that particular, what he was trying to teach me in that moment was, was Ron, ask for strength, ask for endurance, man. You, you know, if you don't ever endure something and go through it, how are you ever going to grow as a person in Christ? You know, didn't Paul call all that stuff for the glory of God? To live as Christ, to die as gain? All that he had suffered, he counted it all glory to God? So it gave me a whole different picture about living a Christian life. Yes, I want everything beautiful. Yes, I don't want to suffer. I don't want anybody else to either. But in this world, it's going to happen, right? In this world, we're going to go through stuff. And sometimes the things that we're going to pray away, there might be something that he's wanting to do in the midst of that that's going to cause us to grow and become stronger for the next battle. Sometimes he's going to allow us to, to go through these types of things so that we can knuckle up in faith and truly believe. See, because what I learned the most out of all of this was trust. I trust God. After going through that, I trust God. And I'm not trying to tell you don't pray in faith and don't ask God to do things. Please, please don't misunderstand me. But there are some times when we're going through something Doing like that, crying out mercy in front of a non-believer and God not responding isn't a good testimony of our God. See? It's just not. So we have to be very cautious about what we're asking for in pain and what we're looking for. I believe. I believe that. So praise God. Thanks for hanging out with me all this time. Praise God. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, brother. I guess I can remove this finally. <laughs> Praise God. Good word. Amen. Good word. Testimony of God. You know, and I know that God is uh, with CJ and Ron, what they're doing over the Internet, and 
And that's just, that's just one thing that God's doing right now. There's going to be many other things. But, uh, you know, all of us go through things in life, and we have to press through them. You know, Paul said that the things that are, are seen are temporal, but the things that are not seen are eternal. God had a purpose for this man, his wife, and the others that he's going to gather around him to bring a mighty harvest in. The enemy didn't like that. And so the enemy used uh, things in his life to access him and to try to stop him. But he stood his ground. And as you stand your ground, you're not going to always understand every element of that, like he was saying. But if you persevere, if you keep going, you're going to come out from under that valley of the shadow of death. And you're going to find yourself in the green pastures. And more important than that, you're going to find yourself being able to do what God put you on this earth to do. Amen. Well, let's stand tonight. Praise the Lord. God is good. Amen. All the time. So, Father, we dedicate this week to you. We commit ourselves. Use us for your glory. Oh, yes. Use us for your glory tonight, Lord, and to tomorrow, all this week. Put us in positions to minister to people. Help us to be just bold enough to open our mouth and let you fill it. Because you want to touch people this week in Madeira. You want this city to be moved, as Ron read in the scripture, because Jesus is here. He's here in us. Now, Lord, we pray for this, for Laverne. We pray for Holly's mother, who is uh, mother-in-law. Is it her mother-in-law or mother? Mother-in-law. We pray for her right now, Lord. She called us and said that she's agitated and that uh, they don't have the medications that they need for her right now. So we come against that agitation that spirit of fear or confusion or whatever it is that might be harassing her. Lord, we ask you to balance her brain chemicals if need be. We ask you to touch her. We ask you to help her. We ask you to strengthen her. And I speak peace over her being right now in that room. Lord, let the angels be dispatched to come and bring your presence, that presence that just, uh, just causes the peace of God to be manifest. Lord, we pray for her and we pray for Holly. We thank you, Father, for ministering to them in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless you. We're going to be here Wednesday night. Mark Wilhite will be with us Wednesday night. There won't be a prayer meeting, but Brother Mark Wilhite will be here. He'll probably be giving us some testimony about the Ukraine and some other places God's using them in. So come on out Wednesday night at 7. Praise God. Men's meeting tomorrow night at 630. And women's meetings as well tomorrow night, Sabrina. Women's meeting tomorrow night as well. So come on back.